Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well and in good spirits wherever you are in the world. And I would very much like to continue our discussion of the works that are found in the curated collection of films that are under this title, Pioneer of African American Cinema. And the film that I'd like to talk about today is the Oscar Michaud work, which is from 1920, and this is called The Symbol of the Unconquered. The Symbol of the Unconquered, the story of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, before I go any further, I should mention that what we have at present in terms of the currently existing uh, extant prints uh, the only thing that we have is a what is essentially a fragment, as Charles Musser describes it uh, in one of the supplemental interviews that he gives. This is a long fragment of the film. In other words, it is not the complete film. We are very fortunate to have any print of this at all. And as some of you will know, uh, this is based off of a, a print that was found in Europe. And so... Uh, it, there was great care given to restore this, uh, what we have, the existing materials, and there was also great care given to try to uh, provide translations into English of the intertitles. And so what we have here is the product of a lot of hard work of a lot of restorers and film historians who are really trying to preserve as much of the materials of Oscar Michaud's silent films as possible. And we must really give uh, these people and give their, uh, we must really give them all the credit that is due because uh, this work is really essential and uh, very, very valuable, not only in terms of studying uh, the works of Oscar Michaud, uh, and not only in terms of studying uh, silent film and American film, but also in terms of cinema, period, because these works are an, uh, a really essential part of the uh, cinema landscape from the early part of the 20th century. And so uh, the, the fact that these films uh, are being discovered and being restored as they are is so wonderful uh, in and of itself, of course, of course, and you don't need me to tell you that. But at the same time, we have to remember that this is a very delicate world in terms of surviving prints and what is surviving, what doesn't survive, what prints are surviving but damaged or incomplete or other things of that nature. And so uh, we have to uh, understand that uh, sometimes what we get now uh, and what we are able to watch in terms of existing extant prints now um, are not always complete. And so we always have to keep that in mind. This is true for the work, The Symbol of the Unconquered. It is uh, a, a film print that exists, but it is not the complete film. According to the Blu-ray materials that we have here, the version that we have on this particular Blu-ray is 59 minutes in length. And according to the scholarship, uh, for example, the scholarship by Pearl Bowser and Louise Spence, which is called Oscar Michaud's uh, Symbol of the Unconquered, Text and Context, um, this is this version the extant print is 3,852 feet, uh, which consists of a uh, little more than half of the seven total reels. And incidentally, this scholarship by uh, Pro Bowser and Louis Spence can be found in the uh, uh, compilation work called Oscar Michaud and His Circle, African American Filmmaking and Race Cinema of the Silent Period, which is a book that is listed in the short uh, suggested reading list bibliography that I've compiled, which is down in the description box below in case you're interested. And it's a great essay, by the way, on Symbol of the Unconquered. So I strongly recommend it if you are able to catch up with it. It's a book, that, it's a readily available book, by the way, so you can get a, 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 a hardbound uh, copy or paperback bound copy of the version of the book, or you can get it on, a, on a, maybe a, a reading a tablet or device or something of that sort. Uh, it's highly recommended. 
Um, and so, uh, again, uh, going back to the symbol of the unconquered, again, we have to understand that what we have is a, a fragment. It is a long fragment, granted, but it is still, in many senses of the word, a fragment. And so it might be difficult in that way to really give this film a, a real thorough and uh, robust uh, assessment simply because it is incomplete and sometimes it's very difficult to give a robust assessment to a, a print of a work and such print is an incomplete version and so we just have to keep that in mind of course um, at the same time at the same time I think what we have is really uh, very uh, uh, substantial in terms of what is existing and what it is we are able to see and we can of course chart the story and the progress of the narrative we can chart the characters we can follow their stories because there are a number of characters and each with his or her own distinct and separate and uh, and uh, individualized story uh, because each has his or her own particular character concerns going forward and I'll try to get to that a little bit later in this video. Uh, the point I wanted to bring up is that this is I think a, a, a substantial enough fragment to be able to really take a lot from it and to try to uh, to uh, see what it is that Oscar Michaud uh, apparently was trying to do in terms of this particular work uh, that falls, as I say, still pretty early in terms of his entire silent film filmography. And in that sense, I think it is very important. And it also shows, I think, further um, concerns and issues that... I think Oscar Michaud was uh, apparently uh, concerned with. There are some similarities, of course, with an earlier work by Oscar Michaud called Within Our Gates. And maybe I'll try to talk a little bit about those similarities. However, I should also point out that there are also a number of distinctions made from that earlier work, which I think makes The Symbol of the Unconquered a fascinating watch and one that hopefully uh, if you are watching this video hopefully you have already seen and um, and uh, I also hope that uh, you are able to watch it not once but many many times because I think it really reveals so much uh, after each viewing and even so I think there are a lot of mysteries and a lot of ambiguities that remain which uh, in turn make the discussions uh, about these films and about this film in particular I think really uh, worthwhile and w speaking of which I should mention also that I am no uh, by no means an expert when it comes to this particular film or Oscar Michaud and so I have tried my best to provide a uh, reading list which is down below it is not by any means an exhaustive reading list but it is one that hopefully will lead you to further research and study and a further pursuit of your own journey through the works of Oscar Michaud. And from there, hopefully you can also find other works and other uh, texts that may be of interest to you if you want to get a, an even uh, more detailed um, uh, journey uh, into the works of Oscar and more uh, and uh, more works and more discussions about the the films of Oscar Michaud and so uh, please refer to those uh, if you want a more detailed discussion of these works uh, than uh, any kind of discussion that I might be able to provide in a video and I acknowledge from the outset that any discussions that I have are purely uh, I, I, they're very very uh, shallow and uh, not at all to the kind of uh, depth and the kind of, of, uh, of care that I think these films really deserve. And so if you really want that, uh, that a, a better discussion, uh, I suggest uh, checking out uh, these texts because these uh, professors and scholars and historians have really worked 
um, a lot of them for many, many, many years uh, with these films, many years. And uh, their scholarship is just uh, extraordinary. And uh, we really have to uh, just uh, also in terms of, of exploring the films, uh, just uh, this is my own way of trying to acknowledge uh, the many great people, much better people, uh, and, and much, so many intelligent, uh, much more intelligent than I, and much more experienced than I. Uh, many great people, many great scholars who have uh, been working with these films for years and who have been just pouring through them and really exploring them and, and uh, going through each detail and trying to assemble the history and going through the historical record and really trying to put together some kind of record to uh, allow us in the present day and age to begin to explore the works of Oscar Michaud and other uh, of his contemporaries during the time. And so I, I, this is my way of just saying that I really want to uh, acknowledge those uh, scholars and historians and film studies experts. And uh, my way of trying to do that is to provide a, a reading list. Uh, again, it's limited. It's not exhaust. It's it is exa it is not exhaustive, but it is one that I think is certainly worth checking out. So please, I really uh, encourage you, if possible, to check out those texts if you can. Uh, going forward. And of course, uh, one of the points of discussion in many of those texts will be Oscar Michaud's work, The Symbol of the Unconquered. So let us now move to a discussion of the film itself, The Symbol of the Unconquered, the story of the Ku Klux Klan. And this will uh, assume that you have seen the film. And so uh, I assume that you already know uh, aspects of the plot and the characters. Uh, and so let us go into a direct discussion of this and let us see what we can try to discern, uh, if anything, uh, from this film. And I think actually there is so much to discern from this and to really take from this in terms of what Oscar Michaud is trying to do uh, in the context of silent film melodrama and also in the context of certain aspects of social issues, and in particular race, uh, race identity and uh, race relations uh, that he really brings to the conversation in a very vivid way and also in, in the form of this, uh, what is essentially is an action western romance melodrama. So this is the film, The Symbol of the Unconquered. Now, from the outset, we have to understand that this is a, as I say, as I'm suggesting, this is a, a melodrama film. And in that sense, I think it is also a film that is meant to be an action entertainment. We understand from a lot of the scholarship that has been made on this film, uh, for example, uh, the scholarship provided by um, uh, uh, Professor Stewart, and also the scholarship that is provided by uh, Louis Spence and Pearl Bowser, etc., that a lot of the times, uh, in terms of the historical record, this film at the time uh, was being marketed and being uh, promoted in the newspapers. And part of the promotion, uh, which we understand, again, from the scholarship provided, for example, by Professor Stewart, we understand that part of the promotion involved uh, highlighting the fact that we have a film that includes uh, action scenes involving the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but I do want to suggest here that, uh, in, um, in other words, the scholarship su is suggesting that the, the, uh, the newspaper promotions and publications or uh, the ads at the time were essentially trying to promote the fact that this was an action film involving action set pieces with the, the Ku Klux Klan and, and that sort of thing. However, I do want to emphasize here that the, the, newspaper, uh, pub, uh, the newspaper ads were not necessarily suggesting that this was a, a film that was, say, glorifying the KKK or anything like that, but this was, in fact, a film that included action sequences that had the KKK, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, in action, as it were. But then it also emphasized that we had uh, uh, African-Americans essentially fighting back 
and uh, essentially they win out in the end. We don't get that footage in the extant print of uh, the film that we have available to us now, but we do get uh, ex uh, explanatory notes uh, uh, telling us that the uh, the the attack and onslaught by uh, the character uh, Stanton and his and the the people that are dressed in the white robes trying to attack Van, Van Allen's land in the final confrontation of the film, we understand that they were driven back and they were defeated by uh, efforts made by African Americans. Again, we don't know exactly who, but there is a description of, of one African American man in particular in bricks, but we don't quite know exactly. Uh, what the what the actual events of the final confrontation are, but we understand, therefore, that uh, while this was a film that might have been promoted as featuring uh, imagery of the Ku Klux Klan, we also understand that the promotional materials were also emphasizing, at least according to the scholarship, that these were depictions of the Ku Klux Klan, but they were depictions that uh, also saw, in the f uh, context of the story, the uh, African American. Uh, characters essentially uh, being able to fend them off. And that's what happens at the end, at least our understanding is. And so my point is that this is, a, in essence, uh, a an entertainment melodrama, or at least that's how it appears to have been promoted at the time. And even with this example that I bring up, I, I do want to say that there is this very interesting uh, overlap or mixture already that we see in terms of the way in which this film operates as an entertainment and the way in which it, it can operate as a means by which we can see it exploring aspects of race and race relations and racial identity. And I think we can see it uh, crystallized in this little a description that I tried to give in it, try to give it in terms of how the aspect of the Ku Klux Klan is, uh, and that aspect of the film is treated by Oscar Michaud and the way it's uh, being promoted in the newspapers, right? In other words, it is used in one sense as being a kind of a way of showing what kind of film this is. It involves action set pieces, but it is also being used, I would suggest, in a way that is showing a different aspect of what might be described as being uh, a depiction of this aspect, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, right? It, it might be a uh, way of responding to depictions of the Ku Klux Klan that we saw maybe in a film like The Birth of a Nation, right? In other words, the promotional materials, at least as suggested, or at least as uh, described by Professor Stewart and others, also make a point, and I think a very important one, to uh, make a point that these promotional materials were also trying to suggest that the African-American uh, characters in the film um, f essentially uh, protect themselves and fend off the, the, the onslaught and the attack uh, on the land. And so I think that's a very uh, key component of the, the, of the promotional materials and of the film itself, right? Because it is not just an entertainment, but it is also trying to deal in those entertainment ways, uh, try to deal with certain social, social related issues, right? And here is an example of promotional materials that seem to be uh, trying to capitalize off of some kind of, of interest, shall we say, in seeing these action set pieces, but then also trying maybe subtly to suggest that this isn't necessarily uh, a depiction that we would see in a film like The Birth of a Nation. And so I think there is an interesting and albeit subtle reversal that is going on uh, in that kind of context. And I think this is a great illustration of how this film operates, as I would suggest, uh, as an entertainment, as a melodrama, as a Western, as a romance on the one hand, but at the same time, an, integ and, an integral to this discussion, at the same time, it operates as a means by which Oscar Michaud is discussing certain uh, specific uh, components and elements and issues uh, that arise with respect to race relations and race identity. And therefore, I think this is a fascinating work in terms of that uh, that dichotomy, if you will, or that uh, the um, the parallel nature of this film. This operates also in 
one of the uh, the most important elements of the film, and that is the the character and the plot. Okay, so the, the the entertainment or melodrama aspect of the plot emerges through the main characters of the film. So, who are the main characters of the film? So, as you recall, we have uh, uh, Yvonne Mason or Eve Mason, as she's sometimes referred to. So, she is uh, the main character of the film, right? She is the young woman whose grandfather had passed away and uh, his, her grandfather bequeathed to her uh, some land, a modest homestead in the Northwest. And so this encourages her to move to the Northwest and to try to make her way in life on her modest homestead as a frontiers woman. And we also have to remember too that she is an African-American and uh, she is an African-American of light-skinned complexion. This is very important because as part of the plot, as you know, one of the other characters, Van Allen, who is also one of the heroes of the film, he is a, uh, a person who has newly arrived to the same frontier area and his plot of land, in fact, neighbors the plot of land that Eve Mason now occupies. So they are neighbors on, the, um, on their own respective homesteads on the frontier. So a frontiers man and a frontiers woman. And he is an African-American and there's already an, a romantic attraction between these two characters, right? And, and as the film progresses, we see that relationship develop in its own, uh, it's a, in its own certain w way, of course. But one of the plot uh, elements of their relationship, which is uh, rooted in uh, in traits of melodrama, romance melodrama, is the fact that there is some kind of barrier that prevents him from declaring his love, confessing his love to her. And uh, there is also this idea of misunderstanding, a kind of misunderstanding that prolongs itself throughout the narrative, which then creates uh, romantic tension that is ultimately relieved or satisfied at the very end when the barrier or the misunderstanding in question is cleared up and everything is free for the two characters to come together at the end and the film ends with them being together and thus concludes the romantic story arc of the film. So that kind of description, right? Um, two characters meet, they seem to be attracted to each other, but they can't confess their love due to some misunderstanding or some barrier, which is ultimately cleared up by the end and at which point they come together, right? That sounds like a melodrama romance story, right? And, and it is because it, it is, right? Uh, and so uh, on the one hand, therefore, this film operates like an entertainment melodrama. But within the context of that, and at the same time, it is using issues of race and race relations. Uh, and it is using those elements of melodrama to make some interesting statements about this. Why do I say this? Because what is the barrier or what is the, the misunderstanding that exists between them? Or perhaps more, uh, more uh, accurately, what is the misunderstanding that Van Allen, the man, has with respect to Eve or Yvonne Mason that prevents him from declaring his love to her? What is that misunderstanding? He thinks that she is white. He thinks that she is white due to her light skin complexion. He thinks that she is white and thus we understand and it is revealed at the very end of the film through an intertitle card. We understand that all the time he thought that she was white and he never confessed his love to her for fear that she, whom uh, he thought she was white, uh, for fear that she might reject him on account of him being African American. And uh, once that is cleared up by the telegram uh, that indicates, uh, and the telegram, right, is uh, this is at the very end, and this is um, um, the Committee for the Defense of the Colored Race. The De Committee for the Defense of the Colored Race wrote this telegram to essentially uh, endorse or vouch for uh, Yvonne Mason and the uh, the and the 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 important work uh, that she has done uh, for uh, for African Americans. That's the implication of that, and it also identifies her as uh, as it says that although she has. Um, 
uh, she ha- dis- it says, despite her white skin, uh, she is African American. And so uh, that's an interesting dis- uh, a way of describing it, right? That they don't use the phrase light skin, they use white skin. Um, but that, I think, is uh, further meant to emphasize the fact that her skin complexion is really such that she really could be uh, uh, considered as white to the extent that one of the characters in the film, uh, Van Allen, in fact, does so throughout most of the film. So this is the quote-unquote misunderstanding uh, that, or the barrier that exists between the two of them in the context of the melodrama. And once that is lifted by this telegram, and once Van Allen realizes uh, realizes uh, the the uh, her uh, ethnicity. Uh, there is a moment where he's described as, as being uh, in a state of bewilderment, but then after this passes, they come together and the film closes with their union. And so uh, this, therefore, becomes a very uh, fascinating way of framing melodrama. Uh, would, you not, would you not agree, right? Because uh, the, the whole uh, crux of the uh, of the, uh, the the misunderstanding is the fact that he thought that uh, she was white, whereas in fact that she was she was not. I think this is very fascinating because, of course, it goes into the idea of 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 race relations and racial identity. Now, this film uh, touches upon, I think, very very directly uh, the the issue or um, the um, the 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 idea, if you will, of race identity and racial identity, which is uh, linked to the complexion of skin color. It's not just uh, African American race identity, uh, it, but it's it's also the idea of of identity, which can be uh, further affected or further. Uh, identified with or further characterized by uh, the complexion of skin color. So we have light uh, complexion and dark complexion. And, um, and so this kind of, of discussion or this kind of setting up of a character uh, with regard to uh, skin complexion, I think is a very, uh, this is a, a v- this is a a, a, a kind of a, this is a, a component of the film which I think is very important, right? Because this I think is a a very um, this is a very a relevant part, a very directly relevant part in terms of a of a discussion, if you will, of of how uh, race identity and race uh, relations how they are formed and affected. And we see an example of this, I think, quite vividly in the context of this melodrama romance between Van Allen and Eve. Now, we understand uh, from this letter that Van Allen receives at the end that uh, Eve Mason, or Eva Mason, apparently has been fighting for uh, the you know, African American causes, and so she has uh, she has been doing this, which suggests, therefore, that she has not been passing herself off as white. There isn't any direct uh, story narrative info that we get in the print that we have currently extant of, uh, available for us to watch. Now, there isn't anything that I can identify that shows us that she has been, quote-unquote, passing herself off as white or trying to pass herself off as white. We don't get anything like that. She just, and we don't necessarily see any glimpses directly anyway as to whether or not she appreciates the fact that there might be other characters that might be, uh, might be, um, uh, uh, might be uh, considering her or might be viewing her, might be thinking that she is a white woman, but in fact she's not. We never see those sorts of interactions. So, for instance, we see uh, her, uh, Eve, uh, Eve Mason, interact with uh, Mary uh, Barr, who is the wife of the former clergyman, right? And they become friends. But we don't necessarily know if 
uh, Mary Barr's friendship with uh, Yvonne is based off of, a, of her own misunderstanding about uh, Eve's ethnicity. We never get any of that information. The same thing too with uh, Eve's relationship that forms later in the film with the mother of Jeff Driscoll. Uh, Mother Driscoll is the name of the character. And again, Mother Driscoll, or Mrs. Driscoll, is herself African-American. Um, and uh, what we don't necessarily get a sense as to uh, whether or not Mrs. Driscoll thinks that Eve is white or if she's not. We don't get that sense. And we never get any uh, development as to those sorts of considerations to the same degree that we get insight into what Van Allen thinks of about Eve's ethnicity when he meets her. And so we don't necessarily know, therefore, if Eve herself knows that people think of her this way, if Eve uh, maybe uses this in some way, if she passes herself off or tries to do so. We don't get this information uh, throughout the film. Perhaps the only glimpse of this is early on in the film when she goes to the hotel for the first time and where she meets Jeff Driscoll. And Driscoll at first uh, is very welcoming to her as a guest, but then the intertitle card uh, tells us that he was able to recognize that uh, of, she was, he was able to recognize her ethnicity by looking into her eyes and it revealed it. So then he, by looking into her eyes, understands that she is black and so he refuses her board and instead he says that she can sleep in the barn. So that's a really terrible, ugly, uh, ugly example of racism from, uh, from Driscoll. But, uh, and we see a moment of a close-up on Eve's face and we see her crying. We're not quite sure exactly the specific reason why she's crying. Maybe she's crying because she's tired. She's just come out from, uh, from her home to this area for the first time. She doesn't know anyone. She doesn't know where she is. And she's just been rejected uh, by the, this hotel. Maybe it was that. But I think we can also uh, interpret her reaction to mean that maybe she understands that uh, she is being rejected on uh, because of her uh, her ethnicity because of her race and so I think therefore uh, we see a little bit of a glimpse of this but this is I would suggest maybe one of the only times we get a sense of this possibility as to her own psychology and her own awareness of her of her uh, of her particular uh, her, her particular, uh, shall we say, character and how it might be perceived by others. The only other time we therefore see it is at the very end when, uh, when Van Allen realizes the truth about her, uh, her, uh, her race and he expresses a sense of bewilderment. That's the word that's used in the intertitle card. And she, in turn, confuses this or mis uh, she, uh, she wrongly thinks that he is bewildered because he is rejecting her. And so perhaps this is also, it's not revealed in the intertitle card, but maybe her feelings of rejection uh, uh, might be due also to the fact that uh, maybe for some reason, maybe something similar to the way Driscoll in the hotel had rejected her earlier, maybe she thinks that Van Allen, who is African American, is still rejecting her upon discovering that she too is African American. And so maybe she thinks, just like Driscoll might have had a sense of this real uh, uh, loathing of African Americans, which translates to, of course, this idea of self-loathing, maybe she thinks that something similar is happening, happening with Van Allen at the end, which causes that momentary uh, bit where she is uh, really grief-stricken because she thinks that she is now being rejected by Van Allen, only for that moment to pass once Van Allen uh, real realizes what's going on and they get together and the film ends. Uh, in terms of their relationship, relationship anyway, it ends on a happy note because they are uh, at long last united. And so uh, uh, the, the, the point I wanted to bring up here is that Eve Mason, or Eve Mason, therefore presents a very uh, fascinating uh, way through melodrama to explore this idea of light skin complexion and dark skin complexions and uh, what's also referred to as brown skin complexions. And we see how this, uh, this can affect uh, treatment of people in the context of race relations and racial identity. 
And so this is a, a very key component of the film as well, uh, this idea of, of the skin complexion and how that really uh, uh, makes an impact. Uh, this, uh, you know, before I go to the next point, this also is very much uh, played out in the context of the character of Driscoll. I mentioned uh, Jeff Driscoll earlier. So he is the man who is described by the intertitles as being a mulatto, which, um, which, is, which means, therefore, that he has an African-American mother whom we see in the film. And we assume that uh, the likelihood is therefore that he had a white father and we don't get any references to the father we don't see the father so we don't know the backstory regarding his father we just know this reference to the with the use of the word mulatto in the intertitle card and we see the the mother uh, mrs driscoll make an appearance and uh, we also note that uh, jeff driscoll is uh, at least when we see him on film we see him as being uh, a, a man who has a, a skin complexion that is light and we see a moment where, where and we understand he tries to pass himself off as white and he has what is described as being a hatred for African Americans, and we understand this this uh, psychology further due to an incident that is revealed in a flashback, where he was trying Driscoll is trying to essentially woo a young woman who uh, appears to have been a white woman. So he was trying to woo or seduce a white woman, or romance a white woman, and at that very precise moment his mother appears, and his mother is African-American, and this uh, then uh, essentially reveals the fact that he is African-American himself, and this causes a rejection by the young woman whom he was trying to romance, and she walks off. And this, this creates a, a real torrent of rage uh, from, uh, from Driscoll towards his mother, and he's assaulting her, attacking her, just really rejecting her. Uh, out of rage, and this is uh, this, this the placement of this flashback. This flashback is therefore to suggest that his rage is due to the fact that he was unable to romance this woman that he was attracted to, who was white or who appeared to have been white. And he, the way that he was he was trying to do so was to pass himself off as white. And so through this episode, we understand that he therefore harbors this uh, this really. Um, uh, this this real resentment uh, towards African Americans, which plays itself out in acts of racism. Uh, when he is running the hotel, he doesn't give uh, Abraham or Eve a room to board. Instead, he has them sleep in the barn, which is a terrible act, absolutely terrible act. But um, but the, and uh, later we see him trying to f uh, swindle Van Allen, who is also an African American, because of the the, the stolen horses, etc. I mean, this is an interesting little uh, setup, right? In the when he's working at the hotel, Driscoll, instead of trying to swindle people out of money, he instead Instead, insists that they just sleep in the barn, whereas with uh, Van Allen, he is very much uh, willing, at least on the surface, to try to enter into uh, financial transactions with him, only to uh, have the basis of that transaction be in fact fraud. So it's an interesting little uh, comparison where earlier in the film he wasn't even willing, it seems, to enter into any kind of uh, seemingly, uh, s seemingly legitimate transactions with these people. Um, instead, he just says, you can sleep in the barn. But uh, he, in, with Van Allen, he's willing to enter into a transaction, but it ultimately leads to a fraudulent act. But uh, that's an interesting little uh, character trait, I think. But it's, it just f it shows further uh, how he is manifesting his anger uh, in these uh, really uh, uh, overt racist acts. And I'm talking about Driscoll here. But this is another uh, interesting thing, too, because he is a, a man who has a skin complexion that is uh, a light, uh, light complexion. And so, therefore, this sets up an interesting comparison between his character and Eve, or Yvonne's character. Because, as we said, she is also a character whose skin complexion is light. And we see how that, that aspect, that trait, that physical attribute has affected her relationship with Van Allen. And we see also this aspect or this attribute of Driscoll's character and how it affects his 
uh, relationships with others and also himself. And uh, if I can just uh, uh, expand on this a little bit further, the point I'm about to make might seem a little bit obvious, and I apologize for the obvious nature of the point that I'm about to make, but I still think it's very important. And it's this. This uh, treatment of these characters, yes, it is in the context of a, of a melodrama. And yes, it is in the context of a romance melodrama, an action melodrama. Okay, and I get that. And it, therefore, it operates in terms of these entertainment traits. But it also serves to uh, provide some discussion of race relations and race identity uh, because this treatment of the characters and their uh, and their complexions, their skin color complexions, is being uh, employed in a way to add some kind of discussion, I would suggest, to the very concept of race relations and race identity, right? Because I think what it's saying is that the uh, the concepts of race identity and race relations are based on physical attributes, of course, right? They're based on physical attributes and skin color, right? So uh, this is nothing new, right? Because, of course, uh, skin color and uh, race ethnicity and heritage form the basis of how uh, people relate to each other in the context of race relations, right? And this is this is nothing new, right? But what makes this interesting is that the characters in this film are uh, entering into, or they their relationships that are uh, you know race relations are being forged based off not just on on physical attributes of the characters that are in those relationships, but also the ways in which those attributes are being perceived and by extension how those perceptions form psychological uh, psychological viewpoints that affect the trajectories of these characters and sometimes too or not sometimes but in, but it's it's made even more fascinating by the fact that those perceptions and those psychological viewpoints are not always uh, true. They are not always accurate. So this is a fascinating thing already, right? Therefore, race relations are formed also uh, in large part by not just physical attributes, but by the way that we perceive those attributes. And the way that we perceive them creates a psychological viewpoint in our own minds, and that in turn affects the racial relationships. And when those viewpoints or when those perceptions are in fact not true, right? Because in the, in the case of Van Allen and Elon, Van Allen thought that she was white, but she wasn't. And in the case of Driscoll, right? He is uh, he's harboring a hatred towards African-Americans, but he himself is, um, is, uh, has an African-American mother. And so uh, when these perceptions and uh, these psychological viewpoints are based on things that ultimately we realize are not anchored in truth or accuracy, then I think this adds, I think, a really fascinating element to the conversation of race relations as depicted here, right? Because it means that race relations are determined not just by uh, physical attributes, but also by uh, the way in which uh, they are perceived as, uh, in terms of psychology. So psychology becomes a key component in the racial relations that are being depicted in this film. And it becomes even more apparent by the fact that the bases of these uh, psychological viewpoints ends up being false. Or they end up being inaccurate because the facts of the case are completely uh, different too. Uh, what the what the people are actually thinking of themselves and other people, and so I think this is a really fascinating uh, way of depicting race relations. In fact, psychology is a, a key component in the formation of race relations, and that becomes a very paradoxical or ironic thing in the treatment in the symbol of the unconquered when we realize that it is really something that is based on on uh, an untruth, right? And so. Uh, and, and this, therefore, becomes a really artistic way in which melodrama becomes linked with a kind of 
of concern or, or, or need to discuss uh, this kind of issue uh, in the context of race relations or racial identity, right? It's such a fascinating thing too, right? Because for instance, with Driscoll, right, he is, uh, his, his identification of himself is somehow based on his own psycholo psychological viewpoint or perception of himself, which isn't really reflective of who he is and who his mother is and where he came from, right? And so, and that, that forms the basis of his quote-unquote villainy in the context of this melodrama. It's absolutely fascinating. And, I, and, and the same thing too with Van Allen and uh, Yvonne, right? The barrier or the misunderstanding that prevented him from, from uh, confessing his love to her is this notion, is this psychology that he has, the psychological viewpoint that he has, a perception that he has, which ends up being false. And so it's, it becomes uh, and, uh, so fascinating to me. And I, I really admire the way that, the, the, the way that these points are being uh, uh, woven into uh, what can also be described as being a melodrama entertainment. It's absolutely uh, uh, fantastic stuff, and I think Oscar Micheaux is really uh, saying something here and really doing something with the, the story medium uh, in this way. Um, and uh, another thing, too, I should point out is that he is also saying something in terms of solutions or what he... Uh, what he seems to be presenting as solutions. Uh, and this is also leads me to a discussion of what he is not saying in terms of solutions to certain issues of the time. Okay, so uh, just to uh, uh, give some broader context, if you recall in our discussion of Within Our Gates, we had discussed how in that film it could be suggested that one of the solutions that might be being posed in that film is the idea of education and the importance of education and the idea of the importance of suffrage, voter rights. But at the same time, how those concepts were also being presented in an ambivalent manner such that it wasn't necessarily the case that education alone is enough. Education needed to be fostered in a welcoming environment from the government uh, subsidy or support that wasn't there. And so those solutions, I think, were also being framed in that film in a way that was still presenting the ambiguities and ambivalence as to the real effectiveness of those solutions. Uh, and I think a certain type of discussion is being had in The Symbol of the Unconquered uh, in terms of solutions that are being presented, but also some ambiguities that are also, uh, that remain uh, outside of the text or beyond the text of the film. The solutions that I think are being presented here are different than those which were presented in Within Our Gates. Because we, in this film, we don't get any discussion of education. We don't get any discussion of government uh, subsidy or government intervention. We don't get any discussion of, for example, suffrage or anything of that sort. What we get instead is a depiction uh, of the frontier of the homestead and for uh, trying to make one's way in the world uh, uh, with one own hands, right? And so uh, this is the idea of the homestead, and this is the idea of the, of the rugged frontier life, uh, the independent spirit, spirit uh, uh, given free reign in the context of the rugged independent life on the homestead. And this is, uh, this is a very different from uh, what has been described as being the urban migration, uh, the, uh, the movement of uh, people into the cities for the hopes of trying to find job opportunities and the like and trying to find a better way for themselves in this new industrialized world. Right? So this is a far cry from that. Right? Instead, we, we don't get any uh, uh, depictions of the industrialized world. We don't get any direct depictions of urban centers, urban cities. We never get any depiction of that being the, the means by which these, these, uh, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, the characters uh, make their way through the world, at least for the most part. Right? There is a little bit of a coda at the end involving Van Allen and his 
oil prospects, right? And he has his own company, and and, and that and that that forms a, an interesting coda, which I think adds to the ambivalence of the film. But what what? Let me just take a step back and just say that I think that the solution that uh, Oscar Michaud is presenting here, uh, albeit with a lot of ambivalence, is the idea of the uh, importance of freedom as manifest through the expression of living on the homestead and living independently and having this free will that is expressed through this living uh, independently or living through independent means. We see this with Van Allen. We also see it with Yvonne, uh, Yvonne Mason. And so um, um, uh, this, is a, a, this is a key component to Oscar Michaud's own life uh, his own concerns, because this is a, a very important part of his own biography, as you know, and this is a theme that he worked on as well in some of the novels that he wrote uh, around this time. Uh, the Homesteader uh, comes to mind immediately, and uh, and incidentally, also there are, there are uh, aspects of that uh, regarding um, uh, meeting a white woman. And so uh, that has its echoes, therefore, in the film, The Symbol of the Unconquered. So if you're interested in uh, reading more about similar aspects that appear in this film, I would suggest, if you can, trying to read The Homesteader or uh, reading a biography of Oscar Michaud's life, because, it, again, it's very fascinating and to see some of the echoes that play themselves out here in this film, The Symbol of the Unconquered. But the point I wanted to make is that it seems like with Yvonne and also by extension uh, her grandfather uh, Dick Mason and then also Van Allen, it seems like these heroic figures are being depicted as trying to make their way through the world uh, through their efforts on the homestead. It's hard work. Uh, Yvonne herself, Eve, she expresses difficulty with it. She's not quite used to it. But at the same time, she's, she is not uh, a completely helpless character, right? She is able, for instance, to make her way through the rainstorm at night at the first part of the film. She's also able to ride on horseback and trying to uh, help uh, Van Allen when she realizes that um, uh, the land is going to be attacked by the, uh, what is it, the Knights of the Black Cross, uh, Bill Stanton, which are obvious references to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and so uh, she, ex ex she is able to, uh, 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 she is able to um, uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, she is able to uh, survive in the wilderness, as it were, and she does have survival skills, as it seems, right? And uh, but at the same time, she she is shown struggling a little bit because it's hard work, it's hard physical work, etc. Uh, and she is inexperienced when it comes to trying to um, to plant or trying to uh, have a, a little bit of a, a plot of land for farming, etc. And we see a little bit of that in the film. Uh, but the point I think is being made is that they, these uh, characters are the heroes, and they're being depicted in this way. And so this is consistent, very consistent with a kind of philosophy that uh, might be said to have been espoused by Michaud in terms of the way in which one can achieve a certain type of human dignity, which is a key aspect, an integral part of, of a sense of freedom, right, is through uh, the, this kind of frontier living. And uh, I think that is a solution that he tries to present in this film. But I would suggest also at the same time that it's, it's a solution that also is filled with a number of ambiguities and ambivalences as well, which is also, again, very consistent with Oscar Michaud, the filmmaker, at least as we saw it in the earlier surviving uh, print within our gates. Okay, so what do I mean by these ambivalences or ambiguities? So first of all, this area, the frontier that is being depicted in this film, is not free from racism. It is not free from these horrible, horrible events. Um, and we see this through the acts of Driscoll and what it is he's trying to do. He tries to swindle Van Allen uh, with the stolen horses. He makes uh, Eve and also Abraham sleep in the barn. And so uh, this area, and also Bill Stanton is uh, one of the final, uh, final means by which he tries to uh, get the land, the valuable land from Van Allen, is to dress up in white robes at the in night uh, with torches and, and with a, a bunch of other people and uh, ride off and essentially uh, ride to attack and kill 
um, Van Allen to in an attempt to take the land away. And so this is an, an obvious reference to the Ku Klux Klan. And I think Professor Stewart, uh, Jacqueline and Juma Stewart, makes a really great point um, uh, in her scholarship in that this could be seen also as being a, a kind of uh, implicit or a subtle way uh, that the film is suggesting that this kind of racism wasn't necessarily um, uh, wasn't necessarily only in the South at the time, as it were. But remember, this story is taking place in the Northwest, and so it is not the South. And so uh, this, and we're still seeing these very, uh, very uh, charged uh, racial imagery. Uh, in the context of a story that takes place in the Northwest. And so I think Professor Stewart therefore uh, suggests, and I think quite reasonably so, that this is a subtle way of using imagery to suggest that maybe racist a racism wasn't just something that was in one part of the country, but that was actually more widespread than uh, people might be comfortable to admit. And so uh, this might be a part of the, the way in which this film is showing the ambiguity or the ambivalence in terms of this solution that Oscar Michaud might be said to be otherwise presenting, which is the frontier's life. I mean, it's not free from racism, at least as depicted in this film. The other thing, too, is that, um, oh, and I should point out here before I, I move on, uh, an interesting aspect of the depiction of, the, of what are obviously references to the Ku Klux Klan. Right, the, the, the title card is indeed the story of the Ku Klux Klan, right? And so, um, and they are in, in uh, they are dressed up in the white robes at the very end, and and we don't get the final footage, we don't get the the final climactic battle, but we do understand that they were uh, they were fended off by African Americans, maybe one in particular with bricks. We're not sure exactly how Van Allen figured into the final battle, but we understand that he survived and he uh, grew uh, to prosper from his lands because he discovered the oil and that led to the final uh, coda of the film where he has his own company two years later but we don't know the the specifics of the the final battle but we do know that the the um, uh, Bill Stanton and his men were, were uh, they were essentially offended off and they they, they were they were defeated okay but one aspect of Bill Stanton and Bill Cl and Philip Clark and uh, Barr, the former clergyman, and also uh, Tugi, who uh, they are all seen to be in cahoots, and Driscoll. Right? This is a very uh, multiracial uh, group of people, and so this adds, I think, uh, further uh, complexity. Uh, to uh, uh, these depictions, right? Um, now, we have to remember that, uh, so Barr is apparently, he is a white, he's a white man. He's a f uh, described as being a former clergyman. And I think this is also a, another subtle dig at institutionalized religion that we have seen from Oscar Micheaux's films before. But so he's described as being a former clergyman, and now he's a kind of swindler, and he's trying to uh, engage in various acts of swindling and fraud throughout the film. There's one point where he's trying to get documents uh, from, he's trying to use his brother-in-law to steal documents from the house that, um, that used to belong to Dick Mason, but now uh, Eve lives there. We don't quite know what those documents are because we never hear from them again, but uh, there's something to do with documents. And then we understand also that he may or may not be in cahoots. Actually, I should uh, be very clear. There are also, there's Bill Stanton and Philip Clark. Um, who are described as being two horse thieves, and they steal horses, which are then given to Driscoll, who then tries to uh, essentially uh, fraudulently uh, sell them to Van Allen. So there seems to be this criminal network of some sort uh, operating already. And then we have the, uh, the, uh, all the, the, the criminal element, or the, the villains, uh, in cahoots in the final plan. Uh, so Driscoll, Tugi, uh, Barr, and then... Uh, Stanton, and then by extension, Philip Clark, I think, because I think we see uh, Clark uh, in one of the, the clips at the end there. But if I'm wrong, please correct me. But um, in any event, we get the, the core members of the, the villains, and they are uh, planning to essentially steal the land from Van Allen after they, they uh, Driscoll finds a letter that was a negligent, that was dropped by a negligent postman, according to the intertitle cards. Uh, but... Um, the point is that uh, Driscoll, as I described, is, a, uh, is an African-American of light skin 
complexion. And then we have Barr, who is apparently a white man. And then we have uh, Stanton, who is also apparently a white man. But then we have Tugi, who is described uh, in the intertital card as being an Indian fakir, uh, an Indian being a capital I. And then we have Philip Clark, who is described uh, in one title card, intertitle card, to be a, a half-breed. And then in another title card, I think when they're, um, uh, when, um, uh, when Barr is talking with Philip Caden, who is the brother-in-law, Philip Caden, I think, describes, uh, uh, Peter Caden, excuse me, Peter Caden describes Philip Clark as being a half-breed Indian, and that's another with a capital I. And so, and when we see Philip Clark, the character, uh, uh, you know, again, my eye would suggest to me that he is being portrayed by an African-American actor. But again, I can't be absolutely sure. And we should also point out that Tugi, the Indian fakir, uh, is being portrayed by Lee Whipper. And so um, Lee Whipper, uh, well, I mean, I, I won't mention that. I'll, I'll move on. But so, um, so this is very interesting, right? So we have uh, a number of, of of characters here that aren't white or that are portrayed as not being white with whom the white characters um, are in cahoots with. And they are in cahoots uh, and they are employing uh, acts that uh, seem that are racist towards uh, African American characters in the film, right? Uh, but this makeup of the villains, I think, is, is makes for some uh, pretty, uh, I think, um, uh, interesting ways of trying to uh, trying to essentially figure out what's going on, right? And I think also the the complexity and ambivalence is made even more ambivalent by the fact that we're not. I'm not quite sure exactly. For instance, with the character of Tugi, the Indian fakir as he is described, what makes it, uh, because of the use of the word fakir, spelled F-A-K-I-R. Um, and I think this way of looking at this character is taken by Charles Musser in the film notes, with, which is included in the Makino Classics uh, Blu-ray section, starting at the bottom of page 15 on his essay called Race Cinema and the Color Line. He says, Black actor Lee Whipper plays an Indian fakir Tugi, Bolj. Perhaps more accurately, he plays an African American who cannot pass for white because his skin is too dark and so passes for South Asian. A true faker. F A K E R. That's uh, Charles Musser's language. So, again, I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, and I don't know exactly what uh, I'm what uh, what the role and function of Tugi is, but I think, and I think it's also clear um, that um, that this is, uh, I think, one of the the uh, more nuanced uh, elements and maybe more ambivalent elements of the film. But the point I wanted to make is that uh, this uh, this assembly of characters that really plans out this final terrible act at the end, um, they aren't all white, at least as they are depicted. Uh, again, we're not sure exactly who Tugi's, Tugi is. I mean, if Charles Musser is correct, then Tugi is an, he is an African-American who cannot pass for white. Uh, and so he passes as, a, uh, as a, a, an ethnicity that is not white. Uh, so I, that's according to Charles Musser, anyway. That's his his uh, his statement, and so uh, which is, I think, a very interesting perspective on the particular character. And if that is the case, again, I'm not sure, but if that is the case, then at the very least, we can say that this is again another example of the way in which this film is using characters to try to have some kind of discussion, if you will, on the nature of. Of, of skin color complexion and race relations, but here we have um, uh, this this uh, interesting dynamic. Now, I I don't necessarily think it's uh, meant to suggest that the white characters in this uh, uh, gathering 
are therefore not racist because they have associations with people other than white people. I don't know if we can take it that far uh, because I think we can and we have seen uh, depictions uh, in history as well as in fiction where we've had uh, racist attitudes directed not not necessarily to the uh, to uh, people other than one's own race, but we've has, we've also seen racist attitudes directed towards specific other races, and so uh, this kind of specified racism is also something that is uh, a very uh, relevant aspect to the discussion of race and race relations. And so I, I don't want to therefore suggest that uh, this in any way. Um, uh, exonerates uh, the white characters that we see in this uh, in this gathering. You know, uh, in particular, um, um, Stanton or Barr, and um, even Driscoll. I think we can uh, mention there. And uh, but again, please note that Driscoll's position is significantly very different as well. But he does harbor uh, racist racist attitudes and sentiments, as we have suggested, and also is suggested by the the intertitle cards themselves. Um, but um, the point is that. Uh, this presents, I think, a, a, a very further complicated na look into the nature of racism and also race relations as it plays, it plays themselves out. And in fact, um, and, and, uh, but regardless of that, uh, we are still left with a story that involves the attack uh, by these men in these white robes, which is an obvious reference to the Ku Klux Klan on the land of Van Allen, who is an African-American frontiersman. And so I think the, the implications of that, the racial implications of that are, are very, very clear. Um, and so I, I don't think there's any, any doubt about that at all. But I just want to suggest that there is a little bit of, of further ambiguity that I think um, is being played, it, it's playing itself out uh, in the way in which Oscar Michaud is using the, the, the villain roles here. And so once again, maybe we can end this conversation by saying this is yet another example of Oscar Michaud using the villain role, a traditional uh, trait of, mel of melodrama and cinema. He's using the villain role to create further complexities or ambiguities that I think even now um, haven't yet been fully addressed or fully uh, explained. And so I think the questions remain, and I think those are, are great questions to continue to discuss. Um, but uh, just uh, stepping, uh, returning to my earlier point about the solutions that Oscar Michaud seems to, pre to be presenting. So this is one example of one of the ambiguities here, which is that even in the frontier, there is still racism and there is still hardship. Also, I would suggest that uh, even in the solution, we have the ultimate uh, resolution of the Van Allen character, whereas he is, we assume, he becomes an oil baron, and he is in this office, which we have to assume is an urban setting. He doesn't look as happy as he was before, uh, granted. And that might have to do with his relationship or the fact that he hasn't seen um, uh, Yvonne Mason uh, Eve Mason, I'm not sure, but he doesn't look happy. And so maybe this is a subtle attempt by Oscar Michaud as, as to say that maybe he, his life as an oil businessman is not, as, uh, it's not giving as much happiness as, uh, as he once was when he was living on the frontier. Maybe that's the, uh, the symbolism, I'm not sure. But in any event, the film ends with him not on the frontier, not finding happiness there on the frontier, but as an oil baron, essentially. And... Um, so that might be another uh, subtle way in which uh, Oscar Michaud is introducing some kind of ambiguity to his solution of freedom and human dignity through the, uh, uh, through the life on the homestead. Okay. Another way that the ambiguity is, in, is introduced, I would say, or it remains, I would suggest, is that we have to look at the relationship between Van Allen and, um, and Eve. And also we have to look at the way in which um, uh, Driscoll has relationships or ha tried to have romantic relationships with uh, the, the white woman that we saw in the earlier flashback. So let's go with uh, Van Allen and uh, Eve for a moment. We, we have to remember that there doesn't seem to be any overt political message here or there isn't any reference to any, uh, to any overt political message here. In Within Our Gates, for example, we did see newspaper clippings where we had the Reverend 
uh, being quoted as urging the federal government to uh, give more funding, federal funding to schools for the education of African-American children. There was reference there as well as uh, where Sylvia Landry is talking to Reverend Jacob's sister about uh, decrying the situation about how the state not the federal level, but the state was only providing a dollar forty-nine per child, which was uh, which was uh, an insufficient amount to sustain uh, suitable education for African American children in the country. And so there was this notion, if you will, of a kind of government response or a, a, the need of a, of a more robust government response. So that could be in that film described as being a kind of political statement. Here, I would suggest there isn't any similar overt discussion of the need of uh, political intervention or government intervention to make improvements in the lives of its citizens. And so I, I, I don't think there is any kind of discussion here that can be akin to a political statement of that sort. Um, but we do have the, the relationship between Van Allen and Eve which I was saying before, is, uh, is really resting on the uh, misunderstanding that Van Allen has as to Eve's race. And uh, once that is revealed, uh, then, they, uh, then he and she get together. But this, I think, implicitly brings up a, a very important topic, which is the topic of miscegenation and uh, anti-miscegenation uh, policies uh, in certain parts of the country that, uh, at the time, that were derived from or consistent with the segregation policies and also Jim Crow and post-Reconstruction policies that were existent uh, at the time that this film was being made, you know, around the uh, 1920s. And so, and um, you know, these uh, these uh, and these policies in some form or another, and these attitudes in some form or another, you know, persisted. Uh, but my point is that at the time, uh, they uh, th there was this idea, uh, there was this atmosphere, if you will, of segregation and this policy of segregation, and part of that was uh, anti miscegenation, and so. Uh, it's very, very telling, I think, that uh, the film doesn't frame the relationship between Van Allen and Eve in a way that essentially uh, decries the, this idea of anti-miscegenation laws or policies. And the film doesn't say, for example, that it is wrong, you know, uh, men and women should love each other uh, no matter what their uh, racial uh, backgrounds are. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. What should matter is that they are in love and that. The film never goes in that direction, right? It never does. And uh, it instead uses the issue of, of Van Allen's perception of Eve's race he thinks that she is white for the, for most of the film. It uses that perception uh, to then explain to us the reason why he doesn't uh, confess to her, which is that he was always afraid, according to the intertitle card at the end, it says, he was always afraid that she would reject him on account of him being an African-American. And the, the implication is that she, he was fearing that she, being white, would reject him on the account of him being black. And that's the implication. And th in that, there is an, a, a, a sentiment that exists inside Van Allen that this is almost like second nature, right? This is second nature. Like it's, it's almost like there is no, there would be no way that their relationship would, a romantic relationship would be able to to exist because of this racial barrier that he perceives to exist there. So it's not like he is saying that this is um, our my love. Um, uh, you know, love is so important that it really should uh, transcend these concerns of race relations and racial identity. He doesn't say that at all, but he instead he goes the opposite, right? And I don't think that's in any way a kind of harboring of a racist sentiment on the part of Van Allen. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. But what I am suggesting is that this could be seen as being a reflection of the types of attitudes that could have been prevalent outside of the text of the film. Again, based off of my own understanding of what the uh, segregation and Jim Crow era type atmosphere must have been like uh, at the time that this film was being released. 
And so I think, therefore, implicit in Van Allen's approach is this uh, intertextual uh, attitude, if you will, uh, in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, the prevalent attitudes of the time, right? And so, uh, and what's even more uh, painful about that is that Van Allen, what, what does he do? He internalizes it, right? It doesn't. He doesn't externalize it in terms of of, of uh, describing it as being an issue, a political issue, and in terms of an issue that is that needs to be remedied in the social and political spheres. He internalizes it, and and he says that uh, it, he he says it in the, in the context or in in the language of him being rejected. Which I think is such a devastating statement. I think that is so devastating. I mean, it's great that they get together at the end, of course, because the racial barrier, the perceptions of the racial barriers are lifted, as I was describing earlier. But this subtle comment really goes, I think, at the heart of what uh, what makes this film, or one of the things that makes this film really important, is that this kind of very, very damaging uh, atmosphere uh, that uh, came from segregation and that came from Jim Crow and that came from post reconstruction I think is really is is really uh, being manifest in Van Allen and the kind of way in which he is almost in a way um, in a certain way of looking at it, he is negating his self worth and I think that was part of the way in which these policies uh, really operated and 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 in this subtle way, albeit in the context of this melodramatic romance story, I think this is coming through uh, in the film. And so this, I think, really forms one of the most powerful moments uh, in terms of how these types of attitudes really affected one's view of oneself and one's self-worth. Um, and, uh, you know, granted, of course, Van Allen was, he became very successful. He was very heroic in the film. So we can't take those aspects away from his character, of course. But this is still uh, something that was very important to him because he really was in love. And he is in love with uh, Eve, uh, Eve uh, Mason. And so I think this is a very subtle yet important aspect uh, that comes through, that shines through, uh, through the characterization of Van Allen vis-a-vis -vis his, uh, his romance with Eve. Um, another way that this similar time, and, and again, this is not a solution, right? This is not in any way a solution to the problem. Um, because the solution, at least in an idealized world in 2020, a film that would be made in 2020, I would suggest would be this idea, of course, of course, right? That it, it doesn't matter, right? It shouldn't matter, right? The, that um, uh, love is love, right? That, that's, that should be the sort of cinematic message uh, that would carry through. But it's not here. And I think it's, it's the case for specific reasons that I was trying to cite uh, uh, earlier. And it's for that reason that I think this moment becomes a very powerful and ambivalent one. And one where we have to remind ourselves of the world outside of the film uh, that existed when this film was being released in 1920 and in the 1920s. The same kind of ambiguity and ambivalence emerges with respect to um, uh, uh, Driscoll, right? And his self-loathing uh, and his loathing and his hatred for the, uh, what the intertitle card describes as being his hatred for the black race. His hatred for the black race, that's how it's described, right? Because this is, this is so important too, because um, uh, this, this kind of internalization, if you will, uh, of, uh, what m one might call an internalized self-loathing on the part of Van Allen is also manifest very explicitly in the character of Driscoll. And so, right, because Driscoll is the man who has the African-American mother, Mrs. Driscoll, and he tries to pass himself off as white. Uh, and we see that explicitly in the episode flashback where he is trying to romance a young woman who appears to be white. And, uh, um, uh, and but he is, uh, but his, he is quote unquote revealed uh, by the emergence and the, the appearance of his mother at the time. And so he is rejected. Uh, and so it's this idea of his sexual rejection forming the basis, in terms of the film anyway, forming the basis of his hatred for the black race, right? Because essentially this is the episode that causes him to really hate his mother and hate um, who and hate uh, African Americans, and thus it really is an expression of self-loathing. Because by hating African Americans, 
he is hating himself because that's who he is, right? That's, that's exactly who he is. And I think this is another example of self-loathing. And self-loathing, oh, it's a different, of course, it's slightly different than Van Allen's, of course, because Driscoll's self-loathing really manifests, manifests itself outwardly in racist acts uh, towards Abraham, towards um, uh, Eve, Mason, uh, Van Allen is, itself it, uh, and others. But um, uh, the point I wanted to bring up in terms of a, of a comparison is that this is also a self-loathing. And this is a statement saying that you know uh, racist attitudes and racism um, uh, also involve a, a, an idea of self-loathing, a psychological basis in self-loathing, loathing oneself. And it's a very self-destructive thing uh, racism is. And so I, I, uh, I think this, uh, this sentiment, I think, is, is made even more uh, strongly and more manifest in the context of Driscoll. It reminds me also of the um, Mrs. Stratton character in Within Our Gates, if you recall that film. Uh, the, the introductory intertitle card for her character in Within Our Gates was saying, uh, and I paraphrase, was saying that she, Mrs. Stratton, she had a, a, a real... Um, uh, she was against women's suffrage. She's a woman, right? But she's against women's suffrage because she couldn't stand the thought of the of African American women having the right to vote. And so you can see inherently in that intertitle card, uh, which I understand is 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 a translation of a Spanish intertitle card, so it may or may not be totally reflective of the actual film print itself in English at the time it was released in 1920. I understand that with respect to Within Our Gates. But if we were to take that intertitle card at its word, my point is that even with that character, Mrs. Stratton, who's probably one of the more vill villainous characters of that film, even her racist villainy is uh, is suggestive of a kind of of self-destructive nature because she is against women's suffrage because of her racist attitudes and if she's against race uh, if, if she's against women's suffrage then she is inherently against herself because she is a woman okay and I think that kind of self-destructive nature and self-loathing nature inherently plays itself out with the character of Driscoll and it's it's also plays itself out in, again in more subtle expression with this moment with Van Allen. Um, and uh, the reason why he didn't want to confess his love to, to, uh, to Eve in the first place. Uh, so, uh, yes, so, uh, and so um, going therefore back to my grander statement about solutions and ambiguities. So here I think the film is presenting or trying to present this idea of, of a solution in terms of gaining human dignity in the context of homestead or the frontier. But I think the film is also saying, uh, or is also implicitly implying, or subtly implying, excuse me, that is this enough or is this still an ambiguous state of, of being? And I think this is made even further ambiguous by what we can understand to be the context of the release of this film outside of the text itself, right? When we understand uh, American history, and when, when we understand the current events at the time, I think we can realize that even the statement that he makes, uh, the sort of utopian statement of living a life on the frontier, where, I mean, where can that lead ultimately? And, uh, and I think we are left, therefore, with uh, a great deal of ambiguity. Um, it's still an uplifting message, don't get me wrong. Um, and it's a great uh, way to express something that obviously was very important to Oscar Michaud, his life and his art. But I think we can also walk away from this film, and I think this is also on purpose by Oscar Michaud, we can also walk away from this film with a sense of ambiguity as to whether or not that is a really meaningful and uh, uh, way of, of resolving these issues, or maybe it, it does still present uh, certain issues that still have yet to be resolved uh, in the framework of uh, human history. And so, uh, but that's what that that is what makes this and other Oscar Michaud films really great. Um, and so I'm I'm uh, I'm. Just, I find this filming very fascinating on so many levels, and it still, to this day, has many mysteries that I think are worth contemplating and worth speculating on. Here's one uh, that I'll bring up as a kind of miscellaneous point, but still relevant. Um, on page 14 of the film notes, in Charles Musser's essay, Race, Cinema, and the Color Line, he talks about this moment uh, between Driscoll and the young white woman that he is trying to romance and the appearance of his mother. 
And so um, uh, he, Charles Musser says, um, uh, Driscoll is courting a white woman when his darker skinned mother, Maddie Wilkes, uh, greets him and unintentionally reveals his racial background. The girlfriend is shocked by the disclosure and staggers off while the humiliated suitor throttles his mother in fury. Now this scene, which often induces peals of laughter from black audiences, seems particularly interesting because his love interest looks as if she too might have some African blood, and that she too is passing. At least her curly hair and white makeup can suggest as much. So this is Charles Musser's um, speculation about this particular character that we only see in an instant. And then um, we never see her again. At least I don't think so. And her, his speculation, again, it's, it's just a speculation. I don't know uh, the extent to which he, uh, Charles Musser carries this. It's, again, it's just, I think, a, a passing comment. But still, I think it really goes also to one of the inherent aspects of watching Oscar Micheaux silent films and watching other films from this era, era, race films from this era, is that uh, there's something about watching these films and watching the actors and, and really the way in which they, they appear on the screen, the way in which the camera captures their appearance, etc. It really is, a, the, the, the camera itself and Oscar Micheaux's films are inherently playing with this idea of perception. Right? We're, when we look at the films, it's, it's, they're black and white images, and so we're not exactly sure. Uh, you know, the, in, in the application of makeup uh, in a certain way might suggest uh, a character of a certain racial background that is in fact not really what the, the intention of the uh, artist or the filmmaker was. And so I just want to suggest that there are these possibilities of looking at films like this. And there are these ways of looking at them uh, in terms of what we and what our eyes tell us uh, is going on or what we think might be going on. And so this is also in a very interesting meta way playing out this idea of perception and psychology and the way in which our psychological viewpoints and our perceptions of what we see in a film like the symbol of the unconquered, how that in turn plays into or that affects our viewing of the film in the context of race relations and, um, and, and racial identity. And I think this is a great example of it. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying that it's there. And I think um, the fact that Charles Musser makes this, this, uh, this speculative statement, I think it's, 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 I'm, I admire him for making the statement because this is, as I say, suggestive of how this kind of, of dialogue and interaction is not just within the text of the film itself, but it's within, it's between us, the viewers, and the film, and films like it. And so, um, I, and, and, you know, we can watch the film and maybe we'll come up with different conclusions. I think a similar kind of discussion might be had with respect to the character of Tugi, as I was trying to suggest earlier in this video. But um, uh, the point is that we can see these uh, possibilities and these, uh, we can make these speculations and these discussions. And I think they are ultimately inherently related to those discussions that Oscar Micheaux was trying to make all the way back in 1920. And uh, so it's relevant, it was relevant then, and it's even now uh, relevant, not just as, uh, not just in terms of, of us watching these films, but also in a broader context. And you don't need me to tell you ab about that, but these are uh, significant in a much larger context outside the films themselves. And so that makes watching these films very, uh, very immediate, direct, and very, very important. And so, and, and they are also incredible examples uh, of the way in which uh, artistry and poetry and cinematic poetry are being expressed in these very, pointed and direct ways. Um, and what I was trying to suggest in this video about how Oscar Micheaux is using melodrama and using um, romance, traits of the romance film, uh, to uh, really explore some of these uh, issues and tensions, if you will, of racial, of race background identity and, um, and relations, I think, is, uh, is undeniable. And it's a power, it's a testament to the power of his craftsmanship and artistry as a filmmaker and artist and thinker, really. 
Uh, and this is another example, I think, of why Oscar Michel really should be regarded as being one of the premier artists of uh, 20th century American cinema, of 20th century cinema, of cinema, period. Uh, we see his artistry at work uh, most vividly and within our gates. Even within this fragment, the symbol of the unconquered, we do see his artistry on full display most magnificently, I would suggest. And then we will see another example of the only other surviving work from his silent film period. Uh, we will see another example of this in a future video which I hope to upload uh, later uh, as soon as possible with respect to his film which is called Body and Soul. But for now my friends this has been a discussion of the film which is called uh, The Symbol of the Unconquered and I do want to suggest once again that I am by no means an expert when it comes to this film. I do not know this film. I don't claim to know this film at all uh, as well as other people do. And so this is my way of, of really uh, uh, suggesting to you, hoping, and I really urge and recommend, I hope that you can find some or more of the, of the, the works that I listed below and maybe other works that those works will lead you towards. Because again, there have been so many scholars and historians and film studies experts that have spent many years of their professional lives and scholarship on Oscar Michaud and on these films. And so they know these, they've been championing his films for the longest time much longer than I. They've been championing his films for the longest time. So, so in fact, uh, if you are interested in anything that I have to say, please note that um, everything that I have said and more will be said much clearer, much, more, much better, and much more deeply and with much more intelligence um, in the works that I've listed below and other works that are cited in those works. And so I encourage you, please, to take a look at those works and read up on their scholarship, know their names as well, know the names of the scholars and the, and the film historians that are involved in, in this, this field of study, this early silent cinema uh, study. And, um, and also, right, uh, uh, please, uh, I encourage you to try to uh, catch up with the works of Oscar Michaud. Uh, he is an, a writer as well as a filmmaker. Uh, he did write a number of works. I mentioned a few. Uh, there's The Conquest, The Forge Note, and The Homesteader in particular that were written uh, close to the time period that he made these early silent films. And so, in particular, The Homesteader, I think, uh, has a lot of echoes that might be said to be uh, consistent with a lot of the themes that we saw in The Symbol of the Unconquered. So I really encourage you, if possible, if at all possible, to just uh, catch up with some of his written works because they are very insightful and very interesting to read. Um, and then especially when we think about their relationships with the films uh, that we have currently existing and that we can see, uh, one of which being, of course, the great, great film, incomplete as it currently is now, but still great as it is. That is the film, The Symbol of the Unconquered. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you once again, my dear friends, and cheers.